Good morning. Uh, today's video lecture is about ancient Greece. This one might be a little longer than what they have been, but that's because it's a, it's a pretty long subject, but I'll try to keep it uh, as short as I can for you guys to try to keep your interest. Um, I want to start by talking about the earliest Greek peoples. The origins of the Greek civilization, they're somewhat obscure. Uh, historians, archaeologists, not even linguists can establish when Greek-speaking people came to what we know as Greece today. <clears throat> we do know that there were two early groups of people. There were the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. The, Min uh, the Minoans, they're the first civilization to arise in the area of Greece, and they're from the island of Crete, which is just south of the mainland. And archaeologists have given it the name of the Minoans based on the mythical Crete king Minos. Uh, sometime around 1650 BC, the island of Crete was home to the Minoan culture. This was a flourishing culture. Um, almost everything we know about the Minoan culture comes from archaeology. We can't read their written language. We don't know what they've said. Um, it looks like they were a palace-based system. Um, we know that the island of Crete has a lot of different palaces, the most important palace being at the city of Canossus. And it looks like the palace was probably the center of both political and economic business. Um, we know that the palace at Canossus, it's got storage areas. It looks like it was a trading center. And it also looks like the king was the one that controlled everything. That'd be pretty similar to all the other societies we find in the area. So we can assume that there's a king at the top and then there's nobles below him. And the king, along with the nobles, govern the lives of all the, the workers, the farmers, the sailors, the shepherds, the artisans. Uh, the tools and the weapons in my Noans, by the way, they're primarily copper and tin. And it looks like the society was pretty wealthy. Uh, we don't see any signs of fortifications around the palaces or the cities. Sailors and merchants, they traveled throughout the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Minoan merchants traded with Egypt, the coast, the Middle East. And the Minoans are going to set up a bunch of trading posts along the way. And while they do that, they're going to come into contact with a group known as the Mycenaeans. And they're going to be at the city of Mycenae. <clears throat> For the Mycenaeans, we don't know where they came from. Uh, we, we know that they spoke a language that's part of the Indo-Aryan family, which is the same as what English is. So the Minoans, they speak a different language. Their, their language group is different than ours. The Mycenaeans, they are going to speak an Indo-Aryan language that on a long enough timeline is related to English. By 1650 BC, they're firmly established at the southern part of Greece, an area known as the Peloponnesus. And the city of Mycenae is going to become a major city and a trading center. Uh, Mycenae, it is the capital of the legendary king Agamemnon, who is from the Trojan War. And the king is going to be all-powerful, just like the king in Crete was all-powerful. It looks like everything ruled from the top down. The kings ruled from the palaces. A uh, big difference, though, the Mycenaean palaces are going to be walled, where the the palaces on the island of Crete were not. And the Mycenaean economy, we know that there was a strict division of labor. People were divided into either artisans, farmers, laborers, or slaves. And everybody works under the orders of the king. <clears throat> Sometime around 1450 BC, Mycenaeans are going to attack the island of Crete, and they're going to destroy many of the Minoan palaces. And it looks like the palace at Knossos was captured, which is why we think Knossos was the, the capital city of the Minoans. <clears throat> For the next 50 years or so, the Minoans will, will be under Mycenaean rule, but then there's another wave of violence around 1400 BC, and the palace at Knossos and pretty much everything else on the island is going to be destroyed. This means that the Mycenaeans are going to kind of take advantage of the situation. They're going to become the major, major traders of the Mediterranean Sea, and their culture is going to flourish up until about 1300 BC. Uh, starting around 1300 BC, we have evidence that the Mycenaeans suffer attack after attack after attack, 
and by 1100 BC, uh, they're going to have a civil war and destroy themselves. And that leads us actually to the Dark Age of Greece. After the fall of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, uh, there's this huge disruption in Greek life. There's poverty, there's a loss of literacy, and there are no major large kings that are going to control it. In fact, the language of the Mycenaeans and the language of the Minoans is going to disappear and be replaced by the Phoenician alphabet, which is the alphabet similar to what we use today. Because there's no reading and there's no writing, um, there's an oral tradition. Stories begin to be told by voice and handed down. And that's actually where the poems, the Odyssey and the Iliad come from. Uh, those are attributed to somebody named Homer, but there was not any Homer. At least we don't think there was. We think there was a series of people who added to that story and collectively they become known as Homer. Of all the things that happen in the Dark Ages after the Mycenaeans are gone, uh, it's the idea of the polis or the city-state. Now, when you say city-state, a lot of people just think of a city, but really I want you to think more of a county. Within a county, whether you're in Coweta County or, or a Troop County or Carroll County, whatever it might be, there's a major city, you know, LaGrange, Douglasville, Noonan, whatever it may be. But then there's also smaller settlements throughout the area. You also have farmland. You have um, maybe some rock quarries. You have business districts. You name it. That's kind of what a city-state was like. Uh, the the city-state of Athens. Athens is a major city, but then there are other smaller villages around it. All these city-states are going to have a similar culture, similar laws. Or I should say that the people who make up the city-state, they all have a similar culture and they believe in the same laws. And each one of these city-states has their own set of laws and their own way of life, even if they're right next door to each other. That would be like people in Douglas County living completely differently than people do in Cobb County or something like that. Most, if not all, of these city-states have something called an Acropolis. It's basically a big hill in the middle of town that they could use as defense. At the base of the hill is something called an Agora. And the Agora, it's a wide open meeting space. Today, the word Agora lives on with a fear known as agoraphobia, the fear of outdoors. There's also something called a Cora, and that's where the farmland, pastureland, and wasteland is. And wasteland, you might think like a garbage dump or something like that. A wasteland is basically any area they can't use for something else. Because the people are so similar in culture and so, so similar in their lifestyle, they're not friendly to outsiders at all. It would be like if you are from um, Harrelson County, you don't want outsiders to come and live in your county and you make them feel as uncomfortable as possible if somebody from Carroll County moves into your city. There are different types of monarchies, aristocracies, oligarchies, democracy, tyrannies. Uh, these are all different governments that they use. Uh, I want you to notice that a tyranny means something different then. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, today, a tyrant is going to be somebody like a Stalin or a Hitler or something like that. But back then, a tyrant was just somebody who was not elected to government. They took over. The military is going to be the hoplite phalanx. And there's two examples of the hoplite phalanx here. Uh, the hoplites are going to be farmers who provide all their own equipment. Uh, the phalanx is going to be the fighting formation. It's basically a big moving wall that has spears sticking out of it to stab you with. And all these different city-states are going to join together with each other. They're going to form alliances that we know better as leagues. Once the Dark Age is over, we get to something called the Lyric Age. 
And really the most important thing to know about the Lyric Age is all the different city-states become established, they start to become wealthy and successful. The Greek people start to trade with outside neighbors and they start to also expand with um, colonies. They send people to other places to live. And when, if you were from Athens and you moved to southern uh, Italy, you, you remain a citizen of Athens. You take actually like all the laws of Athens to your new home with you. Now let's talk about two very important places. Uh, we're going to talk about Sparta and we're going to talk about Athens. Uh, Sparta is going to be very militaristic and you can see a lot of things here on, on the screen that kind of you know share that with you here. Um, Sparta is going to take on war very early. It is located on the Peloponnesian Peninsula and their neighbor was the city of Messenia. And around the 735 BC year, they're going to attack Messenia. They're going to defeat them in a war that's about 20 years long, and they're going to take over Messenia. The people of Messenia are going to become slaves, and those slaves are known as helots. And after an amount of time being slaves, those helots are going to rise up against Sparta, and there's going to be a second set of war. Once all this war is over, Sparta is going to reorganize itself. A, a person by the name of Lycurgus is going to be put in charge of Sparta, and he's going to make some changes. Uh, all citizens are going to be equal. Everybody's going to have to work together. Everybody eats together, raises the kids together, and there's no individuality in Sparta. Everything is for the government. Everything is for the, the needs of the people. And Spartan womanhood, by the way, this is very, very strange. Uh, women, young girls are going to train in the military just like the young boys do. But that's not because they're going to fight. It's to get them into peak physical form. Uh, marriage happens later than average in ancient Greece, and that's because they want to make sure the women are healthy to have children. When it comes time for marriage to happen, the woman is going to be kidnapped by her husband-to-be, put into a dark room, her hair is going to be cut, and she's going to be basically raped by her husband-to-be. And the marriage does not become confirmed until a child is, is created. Uh, women, they have no say in, in their life. The husband controls everything. The women are like little children. That's how they're treated. And everything in Spartan culture is about warfare. In Spartan culture, they can even expose a child, which means that the leaders of Sparta will look at a brand new baby, decide if it's worthy of living or not. And if it is, it goes on with the parents. If it's not, then they can throw it off a cliff and kill it. On the other hand, Athens is going to move towards democracy, where Sparta remains kind of like this, this war-led um, oligarchy where there's just a couple people leading, uh, Athens is going to take a long trip towards democracy. And it starts with this tyrant named Cylon, or this attempted ty tyrant named Cylon. Cylon tries to take over the government. He fails. He's defeated. Some of his supporters are killed. And it scares the people of Athens so badly that they employ this aristocrat named Draco to write these, these laws that are extremely harsh. And it's said that all of Draco's laws were covered in blood because it's all about punishment, it's all about retribution, and it's all about death. Um, one of the things in Draco's laws has to do with farmer's debt. If a farmer was unable to pay off their debt, then they could put up their farm as collateral and then they could put up their or they could put up their crops as collateral then they could put up their farms as collateral and then they could put up their families as collateral if they still can't pay off their debts so you end up with um, a lot of farmers being forced into slavery and instead of becoming slaves a lot of farmers would run away from Athens which means there's no food being grown in Athens so this problem gets so bad that another aristocrat by the name of Solon is going to be asked to redo Draco's laws. 
And Solon, he's going to free slaves. He's going to cancel debts. He's going to ask people who ran away to come back. And that gets us a little closer to the idea of democracy. And finally, uh, uh, Cleisthenes is going to actually write a constitution that gives the power to the people and the people are allowed to elect their representatives. There are going to be a couple of wars. In the year 490, the Persian Empire attacks the city-state of Athens, but Athens is able to defeat them at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, ten years later, Persia is going to come back with one of the largest armies ever assembled in the ancient world, and the Persians are going to defeat Sparta at the Battle of Thermopylae. When Athens sees what's happening, they ask Sparta for help. Sparta and Athens come together. And the Battle of Thermopylae, by the way, that is where the, the Battle of the 300 happens. Eventually, Athens and Sparta are able to work together, and they're able to defeat the Persians. After that, uh, around the year 430 BC, Athens and Sparta go to war with each other. And this is a war that happens off and on from 431 all the way to 413. Eventually, after a lot of struggle, Sparta will be able to defeat Athens. But once Sparta defeats Athens, Sparta doesn't really know what to do because they don't have the ability or the culture really to rule such a large group of people. All right, I want to take just a moment here and talk about Athens itself and like what life was like in Athens, because when we think of ancient Greece, we actually think of what life was like in ancient Athens. And this is where the idea of history comes from. There are two guys you should know, Herodotus and Thucydides. Both of them are going to be considered the fathers of history. Instead of putting everything in the context of the gods did that, gods did that, they start to focus more and more on what human actions are, and eventually humanity will be separated from the Greek gods, and that's where we get our idea of true history. Pericles is another person you should know, and he leads Athens for about 20 years, and he takes money from all of the allies that Athens gets and puts it into building projects. And it is really Pericles that builds Athens in the great city we think of today. He's the one who builds the Parthenon, the uh, Temple of Athena, the Theater of Dionysus. And the Theater of Dionysus, by the way, could hold almost 10,000 people. Speaking of theater, there were two types of theater. There were tragedies and there were comedies. And the people of Athens would have considered theater their national pastime. Plays were often held they often had double meanings. They were also often at festivals. And there were not very many props. In fact, the props were these, these masks. And depending on what mask you had in front of your face, depended on what character you were playing. Uh, the tragedy was called a tragedy because if you won the, the tragic play, if you had the best tragic play, you won a goat. And a comedy, uh, it actually means komos singing which means like drunken singing or just drunken fun. Here's a list of philosophers that you should know. Uh, you got the sophists. Uh, they ignored the world around them. They teach rhetoric and persuasion, and they were trying to make money and teach people how to be good businessmen and good politicians. Socrates didn't really agree with that. He refused to take pay, and he used this this idea called the dialectic method that continually asks you questions to make you really think about your answers and to think about yourself. Eventually, Socrates is going to question the government of Athens completely, and he's going to be rewarded with, um, with death for it. Plato is going to say that wisdom is a science, and the only way that you can gain wisdom is through proper training and proper intelligence. And Plato is going to be a person who does not really like democracy, believe it or not. Uh, he actually says democracy is the worst form of government there is. Aristotle is a student of Plato. In Aristotle, he says there's no way we can make a perfect world, so let's do the best we can. And Aristotle, his beliefs were that humans were social creatures. 
the polis or the city state was our natural habitat and we need to make our habitat the best that we can so those are your greek philosophers that i'd like you to know uh, women in athens you're treated differently than you are in sparta uh, you're represented by a man at all points in time you're going to get married at the age of 13 or 14 your husband's going to be usually 30. Men don't get married in Athens until they've inherited stuff from their dad. And the primary job in Athens of a woman was quite simply to uh, have a child and produce an heir. There's a group of people in Athens called Metics. Uh, they are people who are not citizens of Athens. They have to serve in the military. They have to pay taxes, but they do not get to participate in any voting or politics. And then finally, you have slaves, and slaves are forced to do any work that their master sees fit. It's also important to know that slavery in Athens had nothing to do with the color of skin. It, were, it was people who had debts originally, and then it goes on to people who are criminals or are prisoners of war. Just for a moment, I want to talk about Alexander the Great as well, and then we'll be finished with this. And I want to thank you for being with me for 20 minutes now. Uh, after Sparta defeats Athens, there's peace for only a couple of years. The, the uh, allies of Sparta are actually going to turn against them. And it's, it's a big mess. One of the people who is watching this whole civil war happen between Sparta, Corinth, Thebes, and after Athens has been defeated is a guy named Philip of Macedonia. He is a Greek person... Uh, he speaks a very different dialect of Greek. He's from the furthest north regions of what we would call Greece today. Uh, he's actually at a battle called the Battle of Lectra, and he is um, witnessing it. And he comes up with this idea of making the spears longer and fighting not in a straight battle, but trying to come at your enemy from the side. And with that, he's able to conquer most of Greece. Uh, the only part of Greece he doesn't really conquer is the city of Sparta. He says it's not worth it. So our hoplite phalanx, they were originally 9-foot spears. He lengthens them to 12. Uh, anybody can be a hoplite. It doesn't just have to be a farmer. And he also is going to use cavalry for the first time. So we have large numbers of soldiers who are mounted on horses. His son, Alexander III, we know better as Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great loved learning. Uh, he was a fan of science. He's, his personal tutor was Aristotle. Uh, he was in the cavalry by the age of 18. He becomes their leader. He lives with his troops. Uh, once a, his dad dies, he becomes the king of Macedonia. And he's going to export his way of life. He's going to invade pretty much everywhere. He invades Persia. He invades the Middle East. He invades Turkey. He invades all the way east to India. By the year 326 BC, his men, they don't want to fight anymore. They haven't been home in over five years. And so the whole army kind of just turns around and goes home. Well, when Alexander the Great gets to, to Babylon, um, he dies and we don't know why. Uh, there are some theories. It could have been a the husband of a lover. It could have been poison or he could have just been sick and drank himself to death or it could have been malaria. Uh, we don't know. Once Alexander the Great is gone, uh, he, his son is pushed out. His three generals are going to split up the kingdom and there's going to be a fight over who controls his body because it was thought whoever controlled his body was going to be the legit successor. The most famous of his generals is a guy named Ptolemy, by the way, and he's going to play in a part when we get to the Roman Empire, or at least his relatives are. So just keep in mind the name Ptolemy. Life under Alexander the Great was slightly different than life was like in ancient Athens. Um, the center of Greek culture, it's not in Greece anymore. Alexandria, Egypt is where Greek culture is going to be located. Alexander the Great, he had this love for Egypt. He declares himself an Egyptian god, starts living like an Egyptian, and he builds a city called Alexandria that becomes his most important city. Speaking of cities, they're not independent anymore. There's no city-states because they've all been united under Alexander the Great, but they're still going to be really important. And culture under Alexander the Great, this Hellenistic culture, 
Um, they're all worried about public, or they're worried about private life, what happens at home more than they are public life. Uh, women start to be acknowledged, and Greek culture and ideas spread throughout the world because wherever Alexander the Great's army goes, Greek culture, religion, language, you name it, is going to follow. Now, under the Hellenists, or Hellenistic society, there are three schools of philosophy you should know. There are the Cynics, the Epicureans, and the Stoics. The Cynics, they reject society and they want to live simplicity. Uh, they're basically um, going to keep to themselves. The Epicureans, they only believe what they can actually see, touch, or feel. So if they don't believe in the afterlife because they can't see it, uh, they don't believe in spirits or anything like that. They have to physically see it, smell it, or touch it to think it's real. They are kind of like hermits. They withdraw completely from public life. And they don't believe in life after death because they can't see any proof of it. Then finally, you have Stoics. They think that man and nature need to live together in peace and harmony. They see the world in terms of good, bad, indifference. And they believe that passion is the root of evil. So if you are too passionate about something, your soul is sick and needs to be made better. Okay, so that's about 25 minutes of lecture. For this week, your annotated bibliography is going to be due along with your quiz. There's a 7A quiz and a 7B quiz and your discussion. So there are one, two, three, four things due between now and the next due date. The annotated bibliography, I'm going to explain what you're looking at here. What I want you to do is take those four or five sources that you gave me with your source evaluation, and I want you to read them. Figure out what they're about. And then after you read them, give me a paragraph or two that tells me how your source will be useful to your paper. So the, the source evaluation, you determine, is it a good source? With the annotated bibliography, you are now reading your source and you're going to put together how it can be used with your paper. Also, you're going to do a citation and it's going to be a Chicago style citation. Do not use MLA. Do not use APA. Use Chicago. Um, if you're not good at it, do your best. There are links in the course. There is the Chicago style quick guide. And there's an example here of what you can do. Uh, this is just practice on how to do a Chicago style bibliography. So just to repeat, make sure it's clear, read your sources, give me a paragraph or two about the source. What is the source about and how can you use it in your paper? So we'll just simplify it and say two, two paragraphs, one paragraph. Here's what the source is about one paragraph. Here's how I can use the source. If there are any questions about that, please send me an email. I don't mind answering questions. This is a big part of the paper because we are one step away from writing now. All right. I uh, hope you have a good time. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to sharing more information with you soon. Bye-bye.